Hi everybody, I am that nursing prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about respiratory alkalosis. So let's get into it. So how does it work? What occurs in respiratory alkalosis? So your patient is breathing too fast or too deep, so <sighs> hyperventilating, and because they're doing that, they're excreting too much CO2. And I know that might sound like a good thing, like, oh yeah, CO2 is bad, but actually CO2 is really important. CO2 and oxygen work together in your body to help keep your lungs inflated, and you can inhale and exhale. It helps your respiratory drive for you to breathe. So we do need some CO2. But when you're breathing too fast or too deeply, you're blowing off too much CO2, and that causes the pH of your blood to increase. And if you remember the pH scale, the lower the number, the more acidic, the higher the number, the more basic or alkaline. So that's where we get alkalosis. The increase of the pH is alkalosis. So some causes, there's a cute little memory device that you can learn. All of these causes are related to hyperventilation. So if you're not sure, just think, what is a condition that can cause my patient to hyperventilate? And the little device is tachypnea, so you're breathing too fast. So T stands for temperature increase, so when you have a fever, right, that sends a signal to your brain to increase your respirations. So you hyperventilate. Aspirin toxicity, so if somebody who has taken too much aspirin can cause you to hyperventilate. Controlled ventilation. So think about our patients who are on ventilators, who are on vents, and we have to control those, our respiratory has to control those settings and we monitor them. Sometimes those can hyperventilate the patient, which can cause respiratory alkalosis. Of course, H is for hyperventilation. Why? You are anxious. So think about a patient who is having like a panic attack. What do people do? <laughs> they start doing that, right? So it can cause hyperventilation if you're anxious or you're having a panic attack. P is a couple different ones. So pregnancy, just the normal physiological changes of pregnancy, the displacement of the diaphragm can cause you to hyperventilate. A lot of pregnant women, just talking, they get out of breath, just talking. So P is for pregnancy. Pain, people who are in pain tend to have increased respirations. And then those with pneumonia, they have a harder time taking those deep breaths and they tend to hyperventilate. N is for neurological damage. So an example of this would be somebody who has a stroke. So something is working in their brain incorrectly. There's a damage to like the respiratory center of the brain, which can cause increased respirations, hyperventilation. E is for embolism. So specifically pulmonary embolism. So a blood clot that's broken free and gone to the lungs. So a person has a hard time breathing when that happens. And then the last one is for asthma. So a patient who's having an asthma attack they will be hyperventilating. Now that we know the causes, let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms. I bet you already know the big one, right? Tachypnea, so breathing too much, too fast, increased respirations. Some other symptoms the patient might report. Feeling dizzy or lightheaded. Some patients will even report confusion and they can even pass out, okay? So if your patient's like, I don't feel so good and they're breathing too fast, maybe they're having a panic attack or something or an asthma attack, they can pass out. Shortness of breath. So this could be evident by labored breathing. We can see this or sometimes the patient will report it. They'll say, I just feel like I can't catch my breath. I'm, <laughs> I'm breathing too fast and I just, I feel like I can't catch my breath. So shortness of breath, numbness or tingling in the extremities. So the patients will start feeling like numb or tingly pins and needles kind of feeling in like their fingers and their toes. They might report muscle spasms or chest pain or even heart palpitations. So these are the big signs and symptoms for respiratory alkalosis. 
And now that we know that, what can we do to help these people? What are some nursing interventions? Let's talk about it. Our nursing interventions and how we help these patients kind of depend on what's the cause. So let's talk about those. We can teach breathing techniques, so have them slow their breathing because part of the problem is they're breathing too fast. Try and get them to see if they can hold their breath to retain some CO2, not for a long time, but to see if they can stop hyperventilating and hold their breath. And then you've probably seen this one blowing into a paper bag. So like that. Breathing into a paper bag and then it retains the CO2 and it doesn't get so much out. If you don't have a paper bag available, sometimes they'll even say do it into your hands. Just <sighs> breathing into your hands, that can help. If they're on oxygen, we want to closely monitor that oxygen. Because remember, these people, they have too much oxygen and not enough CO2. So we want to keep an eye on that oxygen and maybe even temporarily discontinue it if it's appropriate. We want to monitor those on ventilators because the ventilator could be the cause of this. If this is caused by like a panic attack or an anxious person, we want to decrease their anxiety and give them reassurance. And then we can also teach them pursed lip breathing. So pursed lip breathing is going to help you to not blow off so much CO2. So what this is, is you're going to make kind of like a kissy face, like, like that, and you're going to breathe that way. So the way we describe this to patients is breathe like you're drinking through a straw, and then you're not going to blow off as much CO2. So like that. And I wanted to include prevention on here because prevention is so closely related to our nursing interventions. So for example, if this is caused by a panic attack, our nursing intervention is to decrease anxiety. So how do we prevent it? Preventing panic attacks in the first place. So doing things, teaching our patients some techniques to decrease their anxiety, decrease their stress levels, right? Another one, if it's caused by oxygen therapy or ventilators, we need to closely monitor those things so that this doesn't happen to our patients who are getting those sorts of therapies. So prevention is very closely related to our nursing interventions. So that was my video. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.